The Gibson Vance Distinguished Lecturer Series for Legal Studies in Troy University's College of Arts and Sciences brings the brightest minds and the most influential leaders in the legal professions to Troy and Troy students. The inaugural event in the series was an October 2017 appearance featuring Beasley Allen Law Firm founding member Jerry Beasley. Beasley is one of the nation's leading trial lawyers, having tried more than 30 cases with verdicts greater than $1 million, including 15 verdicts that exceeded $10 million. He also served two terms as Alabama's lieutenant governor. Beasley presented his lecture, My Life in the Courtroom, before an audience in Hawkins Hall on the Troy campus. Guys, you're looking out over this crowd, and they told me there's gonna be a few folks here to help me kick off this series. I want to say first of all to Jack Hawkins, my friend, and to all the faculty and students, I appreciate having the privilege, really, of being the kickoff speaker in this series. I think it's very important. You know, I was listening to uh, some of the stuff that Gibson said about me. Let, me. let me clear up a lot of stuff real quickly. I graduated from Clayton High School, signed a football scholarship at the University of Georgia, wound up at the end of that year at a junior college in Mississippi, dropped out of school for two years and farmed. Thought I was gonna be in for a year, have a good time playing around in Clayton and surrounding areas. My daddy said I was so good at it, he kept me a second <coughs> year. And that's when I went back to college with a, probably the, for the first time in my life, became a student and really understood that education was extremely important if I was gonna survive in this world we live in. And uh, he's exactly right about this business, about politics. I'd have to admit I was temporarily insane to get involved in it. <laughs> Lasted for more years than I anticipated. It all started when I managed uh, Jim Allen's campaign for the U.S. Senate back in 1968, when I was a very, very young person. Got the political bug ran for an office, and I will admit today in public, I had never set foot in the Alabama State Capitol or the Senate and got elected to the office of presiding over that body, the Senate. I'm gonna tell you how I, how I got elected. Sarah, my wife Sarah and I went to Tuscaloosa to speak to, a, to their educational TV program out of the university. And after it's over, a, a fellow with UPI, for you young folks who don't remember, there was a United Press International, International back in the dark ages. And uh, Lonnie was one of their reporters and he was the moderator for that TV program. He came over and called Sarah over and said, uh, Ms. Beasley said, I really liked what your husband had to say about his vision for Alabama. I'm gonna help you get elected. So he called me over. He said, uh, what kind of budget do you have for the campaign? I said, right now, about $15,000 total at this point. He said, you'll never make it. I said, well, I probably won't, but I'm gonna give it a shot. He said, I'm gonna tell you how to get all the free publicity that any politician has ever gotten. He said, I'm with UPI, and I feed reports out to the news media. They pick up what I give them, and that's the news of the day. He said, every morning, have your secretary send me a release, a news release, Jerry Bees is in Bridgeport, Alabama, or wherever, and he says so-and-so. Get it to me, I'll get it out. I said, well, Lonnie, I don't have a secretary in the campaign. He said, well, get your wife to do it. So Sarah, every morning, I'd give her the release. She'd call Lonnie and give it to him. From that point forward, every night on the six o'clock news in the Birmingham Post-Herald, the Birmingham News, the Journal, the Advertiser, every radio station, Jerry Beasley was all over the state of Alabama. And all these other folks were spending big bucks. And it was the cream of the crop that I ran against. Wound up winning that election, and all of a sudden started thinking, man, I'm so important. Here I am, Lieutenant Governor, then I realized I didn't even know the rules of the Senate. So I had to sit down with McDowell Lee and he taught me the rules. And there was a gentleman named Senator Gavan at that time who was an, uh, one of the elderly members of the state Senate. He and McDowell Lee 
took a dumb guy from Clayton, Alabama and taught me the rules, taught me how to preside, and I survived. So then at the end of that time, I ran for re-election, got elected. I got the feeling that, Lord mercy, this state can't do without me. I said, I, I've got to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. So, man, I'm going to be governor of this state. So I ran. We ran. It, it was a Labor Day, Tuesday after Labor Day vote. Crazy time to run in politics. Started off leading the polls, wound up getting literally clobbered. I had a involuntary exit from Alabama politics. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I realized I was in debt and really didn't have a job. And he's exactly right. I sent resumes out to all these folks who had been telling me how great I was. And all of a sudden, I couldn't get a response. I did not, and I'm not told-mouthing now, just telling the truth. I did not get one single reply to anything I sent out, did not get a single job offer, and I went to see a federal judge named Frank M. Johnson. I'm going to ask this question. How many of you in this audience today know, have any idea who Judge Frank M. Johnson was? Raise your hand if you know. I want you all to find out about this fellow. He is the, the most single important individual to come through Alabama politics as a federal judge, directly responsible, in my opinion, for the civil rights movement. So do some studying on him. So I went to see him, because I'd known him as a judge. He'd gotten to be somewhat of a friend. And I asked him, I said, Judge, I can't get a job. I said, Bob James has offered me a position, a very low-level position in his administration. Should I take it? He looked over those glasses at me like he had the tendency to do. He said, Jerry, I'm going to give you some good advice. I said, what, sir? He said, get your rear end. He didn't say rear end. He said, get your rear end out of politics. And I did. Never looked back. I never gave it a second thought. Never had any inclination of trying to get back into it like a lot of people do. I simply then realized that I had been a lawyer I was a lawyer, and I could be a lawyer that would make a difference in the life of people. So I get involved, started a, started a one-person practice on Hull Street in Montgomery, hired one secretary, and finally uh, a federal judge named Varner called me and said, Jerry, I know you can't afford him, but I got a fellow who can't get a job and said his family is rich, so you don't have to pay him. Say, would you take him in? So I then hired Frank Wilson as a second lawyer in the firm. And then maybe about six months later, Greg Allen called and said, I am being laid off by the railroad. I'm going to Jones Law School. Could, you, could I be a law clerk? I said, well, Greg, I'd like to have you, but I can't afford you because I can't pay you. He said, well, I'll work for nothing. So I had two lawyers, a lawyer and a law clerk, working for nothing, secretary who was underpaid, and me, who didn't have any clients. So then I ventured on to where we are today. We moved over from Hull Street to another location and started hiring lawyers. Got up to four. My wife Sarah asked me one night, said, honey, said, I think you're getting too ambitious. Said, uh, how many lawyers do you plan to hire? I said, I guarantee you we'll never have more than five. <laughs> and so now Gibson doesn't even know many. We, got, we actually got 85, not 75, <laughs> and 250 some odd support staff, and they all expect to be paid. But I'm going to tell you this. When we decided to divide our firm into sections where each section became good in what they do, develop expertise, in a particular field of law, all of a sudden, we started moving in the right direction. And uh, a lot of people don't, and I, I'll just tell you those four sections if I can remember them. Personal injury and product liability, consumer fraud, commercial litigation, toxic torts, and mass torts. That doesn't mean a thing in the world to you, I'm sure. But in each area, they get very good at what they do. They don't have any idea about the other sections. They couldn't function in the other sections, but they get extremely good in what they do. 
we have full-time investigators, full-time legal assistants, and it's tremendously good IT section. Everything we do, in my opinion, is done right for the right reason. Now, I'm going to just briefly get into the court system. The court system in this country is directly responsible for everything good that happens, in my opinion. It actually controls the bad things that the executives do, the bad things that the legislators do, and enhances the good things that each of those two other branches do. That's why the courts have been under constant attack for the last several decades in this state. This so-called thing, tort reform, was designed to eliminate jury trials and eliminate juries making decisions that should be made by juries. So we survived tort reform, and now we're seeing things like federal preemption, which, which takes away totally the right to trial by jury and puts everything under a federal agency's total domination. You've got something called arbitration. How many of you have a credit card? I know your moms and daddies, for you young folks, probably let you have one, maybe. How many of you have a credit card? How many of you know what mandatory forced arbitration is? Where if you have a dispute with that card company, you have to go before an arbitrator who is hired by the company to decide whether or not you have a valid claim. Arbitration has taken over in large measure what the courts should be handling. I'm not going to get into a lot of talk about that. I'm, I'm going to just tell you that without a fair, independent, free court system, the average citizen in America has very little chance when they go up against corporate America. Since I've been practicing law, I've seen a lot of changes. I'm going to ask, again, ask this. I was also asked while, by Gibson if I would let you ask questions. So at any time that I'm talking, if you'll raise your hand, if you have a question, I'll try to answer that question. If I can't, I'll let Gibson answer it. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to just sort of just tell you, let me, I'm going to ask you a question, though. Start asking, I will. How many of you think, how many of you know what the FDA is, the agency that actually monitors and controls pharmaceutical products in this country? Do you understand what I'm saying? How many drugs do you, th and they also, they have to approve a drug put to them by a company for approval before it can be sold commercially in this country? And we're the only country in the world, by the way, that allows those companies to advertise on television telling you what drug you need to be taking instead of the doctor telling you. So anyway, how many drugs do you think the FDA actually tests before they approve those drugs? Do you have any idea? How about a real round zero? Does that shock you? Does it shock you that you're taking pharmaceutical products today that the federal agency that's supposed to be controlling that company and that product has never tested that drug. They get all their information from the testing that comes from the pharmaceutical companies to them. I'm going to give you a case in point. Have any of you ever taken Vioxx, the painkiller, the magic painkiller? The reason you're not taking it now, it's off the market. Vioxx was a Merck product, Merck, the pharmaceutical company. They started their testing of this Vioxx, which was no better than any type over-the-counter product for pain relief, but they had sold it as a magic portion that was going to take away your pains and your aches, tennis elbow, bad football knees like I've got. You're just going to be a new person. So they started testing it, they being Merck. Halfway through the testing operation, heart attacks and strokes, hundreds of heart attacks and strokes caused by Vox. What do you think the company did with that information? Never mentioned it to the FDA one single time. They reported to the FDA no problems with this product. I'm going to ask you another question. How many of you ever heard of the group, the organization called Public Citizen? Anybody? I know y'all have. 
if, if you don't get anything else out of what I'm saying today, if you feel good about being safe and, and not taking bad med medical products or driving cars that are dangerous, write, if you've got a note card, write it down. If you don't, put it in your hand like I used to do when I was trying to put answers in there. <laughs> Citizen.org, go to the computer, go to the internet and see what Public Citizen's all about. Public Citizen told Merck, told Merck and the FDA, do not allow this product, Viox, to go on the market. FDA totally ignored it. I'm going to back up a little bit. Up to this point, Public Citizen has told the FDA in 30 separate instances where 30 drugs were put on the market, do not put that drug on the market because it's either going to kill somebody, cause something like a stroke or a heart attack or some serious malady. Out of those 30 products, including Merck, 26 of them have been pulled from the market because they were doing exactly what Public Citizen said they were going to do. So we got involved in the, in the uh, Vioxx litigation and here's the way we got involved in it. Dr. Sidney Wolf was a friend of ours who's a medical director at Public Citizen. He called and said, look, y'all need to get involved in the Vioxx litigation because it's going to be something that will do good for lots of folks in this country. So we didn't know what Vioxx was, had no idea, and he told us all about it, so we get involved in it. And we found out, we, we, in, in pretrial discovery, we filed suits, in pretrial discovery, we find exactly what I just told you. They knew about the heart attacks and strokes halfway through the testing, lied to the government, put it on the market, and were killing folks. So we filed suit. We wound up, an MDL is a multi-district litigation where they suck all of the federal cases into one court. This was in New Orleans, came about, about the time of Katrina, as a matter of fact. Uh, we handled that litigation for the federal courts, settled the Vox litigation for thousands of people, not just one client, for thousands, 5.4 billion with a B dollars. But the good part about it, these folks were compensated, but we, we made sure that product was off the market. Now, unfortunately, the drug companies today get a, literally get away with corporate murder. And they have, they are very poorly regulated. But unfortunately, they're not the only industry that is poorly regulated. I enjoy going to Rotary Clubs to speak. That's where you, you have extremely conservative business folks who hate trial lawyers, generally. <laughs> Something wrong with me because I enjoy that sort of thing, going to speak to them. I ask them this question every time. I ask them the same question I asked y'all a while ago, except I, I started it this way. I said, how many of you believe that the government overregulates over your business? Every hand, some of them sent up both hands. They overregulate us, put us out of business. Then I asked them about the FDA. And they just like y'all. They had no idea that the FDA was not testing those drugs. So then I go on and talk about other stuff. I'm gonna tell you, I, I prepared a speech, but I ain't going to make it. Uh, but here it is. <laughs> I listed on there a series of cases that we've handled over the years. By the way, I don't know how long I'm supposed to speak, so when you all get tired, just give me the T sign and I'll quit. Uh, and I'm going to let you ask questions. We all ask questions if I open it for questions, and you can ask me about anything you want to ask including politics. But I'm going to tell you about a few cases real quickly. I made a list of them here. And they were really more than I realized, and so I quit writing them down. I got down to number, let's see, 12. There are 12 specific cases where I know for a fact that our conduct as lawyers in the court system with fair judges, with good juries, and by good juries, I mean, and we discussed that in a little lunch in the day with some of the faculty members. I like juries that, that really understand what's going on in your case. The Johnson Johnson case, how many of you are familiar with the Johnson Johnson litigation right now, the ovarian cancer causing 
uh, baby powder and so forth. I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a minute, but uh, well, I, I, I might just tell you about it right now. We got into the Johnson Johnson litigation uh, really by accident. A lawyer in Mississippi, a single practitioner in Mississippi, had a client in South Dakota, of all places, and tried a case against Johnson Johnson over ovarian cancer, Johnson Johnson's baby powder, and shower to shower. So he tries that case, and they didn't take him very seriously because he was a single practitioner and did not have the resources to really do the discovery. They try the case, and he, even with him being a, a tremendous underdog, he gets a verdict on liability, but they award no damages to the lady who had ovarian cancer. So he called us, and he said, uh, would you all mind, he said, this lawyer telling us, he said, my daddy is a doctor, and he has alerted me to this danger of Johnson Johnson products. Would you mind joining with us? So we say, yeah, we get involved. So we found out from, through his daddy, really, who'd done research, that there was a case here. So we filed a suit in St. Louis, Missouri. Found out later our client was a distant cousin of Rosa Parks. And we had no idea of that when we filed the lawsuit. We filed that lawsuit, and here's what we learned. And I, I, this is going to shock you. If you're easily shocked, it's going to be triple shock. <laughs> 19, let's, let's go back to 1971. Johnson Johnson learned for the first time that the use of baby powder and shower to shower tap products have an associated risk of a woman getting ovarian cancer, 1971. Studies started coming out, and fortunately there was a doctor, a scientific doctor of that sort at Harvard University, Dr. Kramer. Johnson Johnson now says Dr. Kramer's crazy. He went public. He, he, he had the studies, and he went public. So we engaged him as an expert witness, and he has now been a witness in several cases for us. Here's what we learned. At least 10 studies came out during that period of time showing that there was an associated risk of ovarian cancer from the use in the genital area by a woman of Johnson & Johnson products with talc. Over the, over the years, we had all sorts of information from that company in pre-trial pre discovery. I'm going to paraphrase a, an internal memo that came from one of the most outstanding consultants at that time in the country who was hired by Johnson Johnson to advise them on, on their product. Here's what this doctor told him. He said, we have got to quit lying to the government and the public said all the studies, is there, say he said there are 10 studies out at present all against us with more to come. Said if we continue to lie and put this product out there, we're going to perceive just like the cigarette, he, he said the cigarette industry, and you know how that will be. And that's the end of it. What do you think they did? Nothing. What do you think, the, 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 the town is a mineral mined in China sent to the United States in containers. What do you think it says when they get the container? Johnson Johnson gets the container. Possibly carcinogenic, Warren ultimate user. They've been getting that for, for 30 years. They've never warned one single woman. We, uh, I could go on with a lot of other internal documents that we have. They actually have done mock trials where they would go through trials to try to educate their executives and their witnesses as to how to testify against us in trials. And so it, it really, I, I'm no longer shocked at any of this kind of stuff. In fact, these folks need to be in jail, in my opinion. We tried the case in St. Louis, the first of a series of cases, and uh, the jury pool, when we looked at them, this front row here kind of reminded me of them. Stern-looking folk, <laughs> educated folk, 
uh, analytically inclined to think in that type stuff. Had, for example, on, we ended up on the jury, a gentleman who was studying in his, for his doctorate degree, his, his area of interest, genetics. We had medical professionals on the jury, had the CEO of Charter Communications on the jury from St. Louis. Everybody on there would be considered a very extremely conservative juror. And I'll admit, it, it concerned me because I thought these folks surely are going to side with this huge corporation that's got all this money to spend. So when the jury, when we tried the case and uh, Ms. Fox, our client, had died before the case went to trial, so his son, her son heroically took that case forward. We had no idea how it was going to wind up. When we, uh, well, let me back up a minute. Back when they were trying to figure out a way to diffuse all the publicity and all the stuff they were afraid would come out over this product, they, they hired 10 medical professionals of the scientific types to advise them. Three, let's see, three out of the top five that they had on their list now work for us as expert witnesses against them because they looked at their documents and, and told them, y'all are wrong. Now they're saying that these experts that they were going to use, they call them the best in the world. Now they say they're unqualified and they have no business testifying. So we tried the case, first of a series. We asked that jury for $5 million compensatory and 15 million punitive. When they came back with the verdict, 15 million compensatory and 62 million punitive. They wanted to teach Johnson Johnson a lesson. They have not learned that lesson to this day. They still lie to the public. They still lie to the FDA. And we've tried, how many cases gives them? Five cases and the verdicts have all been in that stratosphere. The last one in California, I think it was 417 million. And the reason it was so large there, and that judge did restrict us on a lot of the evidence. It was a bare bones type case that, we, that was actually put to the jury. But the lawyer on the defense side made a tragic mistake. He asked our expert witness, he said, Dr. So-and-so, if you are right and we are wrong, why are not other companies warning on their talc products? What that lawyer didn't realize, one of our clients in North Carolina had gone to Walmarts and she saw two products, not Johnson Johnson, but two talc products and on there, carcinogenic, used at your own risk, and I'm paraphrasing, they put a warning on their products. So when this question was put to our expert, why have not other companies warned women? Our expert reaches in his briefcase because we'd gotten those products by that time. He pulls them out and said, Mr. Lawyer, here's two companies right here that are warning folks like y'all should be doing. So I'm going, to, I'm going to mention one other case. I'm going to give you two examples real quickly, though, of how you're being misled the public. General Motors, good, good company, whatever. They had a program called the 2500 program. That 2500 program was taking $2,500 worth of mass out of the vehicles. Mass being steel, being strength. So they actually reduced the strength of the, of the products, they, the, the steel that they were using in things like the side rails, the shotgun rail, the, the doors actually have rails on the side like this. 40 PSI to 33 PSI, which is an extremely drop in strength. They were telling folks that they did these changes, the 2500 program was just to enhance the ride, make it more comfortable for people like Kate who wants comfort when they're driving around the road. Truth of the matter, every, every engineer lied in the depositions except one young engineer. When the question was, every, everybody else had said, has nothing to do with safety, does not hurt the strength and this type thing. This guy under oath said, yes sir, 
I'd have to admit that it does make them less safe. And it does do exactly what y'all are saying. So we try that case, win it, 2500 program went away. There was another one that I'm not going to get into detail on, but they had what General Motors again had the silent recall program. They knew they had a defect, a stalling defect in their vehicles where you'd be riding down the road and it'd stall. They had silent recall. They'd say that uh, Walter was the dealer. They'd send him a service bulletin and say, Walter, if Gibson comes in with a vehicle that has stalling problems, here's why it's stalling. Fix it, get him to pay for it. If he won't, we will. They were doing that all over the country. And we had a case where vehicle stalls in an intersection, a grandson of a grandfather in the truck was killed. So, the sudden acceleration case that we tried in Oklahoma City where Toyota had known for 10 years that their vehicles, because of a computer glitch, would go into an unbelievably high speed up to 100 miles an hour with no control over reducing the speed. They knew it for 10 years, never told the government, actually hired away from the government the man who was Mr. Tomasino, an engineer who worked for the government who was going to investigate them. They hire him away at six figures and all of a sudden he becomes the wonder. They call him the wonder for Toyota. Everything goes to or from the government, goes through Mr. Tomasino. So we filed this lawsuit for this uh, family where they lost family members where their car took off like that. We try the case, and but before we try it, I guess it was the week before, President of Toyota is on television, the Today Show, NBC, and he tells them we have no problems at all with these vehicles. It's all driver error. Sometimes they hit the wrong whatever and they take off, say it's not our fault. That morning, Mr. Tomasino has a conscious attack. He begins to say, I just can't go along with this any longer. He sends the president this email, and I'm going to quote it. He said, Mr. So-and-so, we have got to quit lying to the government or we're all going to jail. And Mr. Thomas, this is Tomasino talking. The president, with that in hand, goes on television and tells the world that we have no problem. We try the case, get a verdict. All the cases now have been settled. General Motors again, I'm not picking on them, but it's happened to be on my mind. The sudden acceleration case is Toyota. The ignition switch case with, with General Motors where they knew that the ignitions were failing, cars would be going down the road and all of a sudden shut down, every system shut down, including power steering, it locks up, you cross the center line, you have no control over your vehicle, folks are getting killed all over the country. For 10 years, they withhold that information knowing what was happening from the government. How many of you have heard of that case, the General Motors Sun Accelerator? This ignition switch deal, we had the, the company Delphi call us up one day and said, Mr. Beasley, can we come see you? And sure. So they come down, bring three engineers and a lawyer. They turn over all their documents to us, all the bad documents showing that everybody knew that they had this problem and had known it for 10 years. So, I am on time. Well, students uh, may have to go to class. I'm going to give you one more and, and be quiet. <laughs> but this is one you need to hear. But I was asked at noon in which case, of all the cases I'd handled probably sticks out in my mind. And the reason it does is the first of this type that we tried, Greg Adler and I tried it, a, a Kubota tractor. A, a farmer that I happen to know from being a child, he was an older fellow and I knew him, going down to a farm pond, his vehicle, his tractor rolls over, he's pinned underneath it, and he stays there in the hot sun in July, ants all over him, finally dies from shock. And we take that case, and frankly, I didn't know that, that there was a big time problem with the rollovers. So we get into the case, and long story short, we file it, and we find out. And here's the way we found out. 
uh, Kubota had fired a group, the safety consultants. And the safety consultants had certain documents that were later very important to us. They had what's called a retrofit committee. And that retrofit committee was going to decide whether or not we need to go out, we know who owns these tractors, and tell them that we're going to put roll bars over the top and seat belts on them to make them safe from rollovers because we've been having hundreds of rollovers every year. So they have these meetings and they decide to bring, bring the bean counters in. And they say it will cost us X number of dollars if we go out and retrofit all these tractors and put them on the new tractors, or we can run the risk, let lawsuits happen, settle them and see how it comes out. The bean counter said it will cost us this much if we retrofit down here if we don't. So the consensus was run the risk. So we have these documents. We take the deposition of the man, the chief engineer, who was the chairman of the retrofit committee. And we ask him the question, did you have a retrofit committee? First of all, we ask him, did you have a rollover problem? The answer was no. Then we ask him, did you have a committee called the retrofit committee? He said, absolutely not. Ask him then, we had, the, we had the documents. We asked him then, weren't you the president, the chairman rather, of that committee? And he used a cuss word. He said, Mr. Beasley, blankety blank, how could it be me being president if we didn't have a committee? So we just stopped right there. Go back to the judge and say, please order this man to come from California to Alabama for trial. Guess who our first witness was? We call him, put him on the stand as an as a adverse witness. We can cross-examine him then, and we ask him those very same questions. Then we show on a big screen the committees that he was chairman of that he had just told the jury under oath did not exist. So it, it, the end of the story, though, is the thing that really gets my attention more than anything else. I got a lot of heroes in my life. One of them is named Dixie Merle Spivey, the widow of Derwood Spivey. When we filed this suit and get ready for trial, I get a call on a Saturday afternoon. I was down at the office working from Bill Allen, very good lawyer in Birmingham, defending the case. I said, Jerry, I'm going to do you a favor. I said, we ain't going to sue you for malicious prosecution. We're also going to pay you $50,000 to take care of your expenses. I said, what do you think? I said, no, thank you. We're going to trial. He didn't know we had his documents, obviously. So we go to trial, try it for five days, fixing to really bust him, in my opinion. This was years ago. When, so here's what happened. Friday, after, Friday morning, fifth day of the trial, we drive up to the courthouse. And there's Bib Allen and about 10 folks. Some of them look like bodyguards. Thought they were either going to kiss me or whip me. Wasn't sure which. <laughs> So he said, Jerry, I want to settle the case. I said, let's go talk. So we go back in the courthouse. He says, I'm going to pay your client $10 million. It sounded great. He said, but here are the conditions. Total confidentiality, return all those documents you stole from us. All the testimony is going to be sealed under oath, and you will never mention this to the, anybody. I said, well. I can go talk to the client and tell her. I go up, Ms. Spivey had all the children in there, including one son who worked for the Department of Agriculture in Washington. I said, Ms. Spivey, they have offered you $10 million, which is a very good offer, but there's some conditions. She said, what are the conditions? I told her. I said, what do you want to do? I remember this is a, a rural lady with 10 children. One in college, graduated, working with the government. She said, Jerry, you knew Derwood, didn't you? I said, yes, ma'am, I did. So let's just put it in reverse. Say Derwood was sitting here, and you asked him that question, and I was the one who had been killed. Say, what do you think Derwood would have said if you said, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know, ma'am. What? I won't say exactly, and this is not exactly nice, but here's what she said. She said, you go there and tell those folks to keep the damn money. 
said, I'm not agreeing to this confidentiality. I was shocked, to be honest with you. Here's a lady, lost her husband, never had made more than a farming type living, and she turned down $10 million. So I go down, I tell Bib, I quoted exactly what she said. He said, you got to be blanking kidding. <laughs> I said, no. I said, that's what she said. He said, let me go call him. So he goes upstairs and calls California. They call Japan, I reckon. And they come back and say, we're going to take you, we're going to pay you, because I know you're fixing to get $100 million. So we get the 10. Next morning, I call a news conference. All the news media came. Back then, they'd come because you didn't have all this, quote, fake news, they call it now, floating around, for whatever that's worth. So they all come, and we show them all these documents and tell them this story. And so they put it out. It goes international. It goes all over the world. So fast forward one month. What do you think Kubota puts on their website? We, Kubota, are leading the industry in putting ROPS protection, roll bars, and seat belts on our tractors. I knew then that I was in the right business because that woman, if it had been my decision, I'm not sure I would have had the courage to turn down $10 million in her situation. She looked me in the eye, didn't bat an eye, and told me to tell them, keep the damn money. And I did. So now, you, you find a tractor out there that hadn't got this rolling bar, you thank her for it. I could, I could expand on this in, in so many areas where our clients have, have, have really been courageous and have taken, David and Goliath, that's the name of the game. That's what we do. And that's what keeps me going. Two things keep me going. I enjoy it, I know I'm helping folks, but there's another reason Working for my wife would be a whole lot tougher. <laughs>